Aloha and welcome everyone to our Creative Lab Hawaii Playwrights panel. I'm Georgia Skinner, Chief Officer for the Creative Industries Division for the State of Hawaii. It's my pleasure to welcome you today and share something that is very important to us here in the State of Hawaii, and that's empowering our local creative entrepreneurs. In fact, that's why Creative Lab Hawaii was founded. Founded back in 2012, we decided that this was a key aspect of really giving our talent in the state a better sense of the business of the industry, as well as honing their skills with top level talent, many of which you'll meet today. First, I'd like to thank Michael Palmieri, our executive director, who has guided this program, building community between fellows and mentors, and that lasts a long time after these programs. And so Michael, thank you for your dedication to Hawaii's community. A special thanks to our partners for the CLH Playwrights Immersive, our Dramatist Guild Foundation, Hawaii State Theater Council, the Dramatist Guild, as well as our stellar mentors, who you'll meet shortly. And now for our moderator today, Donna Blanchard is well known here in the state of Hawaii as a leader in our performing arts community. She's the managing director of Kumukuhua Theater, president of the Hawaii State Theater Council, executive team member of the Ohina Showcase Labs and Films, and a community advisory board member for the Hawaii Public Radio. All of these very important to us as our community is growing and developing so strongly in these areas. She received her BFA from the Professional Actors Training Program of Wright State University, followed by her stint at Chicago's famed Second City Training Center. Acting, directing, teaching, business direction, and specializing in areas of growth and rescue are among the bailiwick in Donna's kit bag. Donna is also a freelance writer and author and illustrator of the book, Sometimes Adults Are Stupid, but you shouldn't use that word. It's my pleasure to introduce Donna Blanchard. Take it away. Thank you so much, Georgia. Um, in just a moment, I'm gonna introduce our panelists, but first I wanna share with you a little bit about this webinar. Um, the conversation with our panelists will last approximately 40 to 45 minutes, which will leave us about 10 to 15 minutes for your questions, questions from our viewers. Please post your questions by using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and we'll choose questions from the queue when we start that portion of the program. We'll get to as many as we can in the time that we have allotted. Now to our amazing panelists. So I'm so excited to talk with these fellows. Uh, Lloyd Sa is the author of The Chinese Lady, Charles Francis Chan Jr.'s Exotic Oriental Murder Mystery, American Huangop, The Wong Kids and the Secret of the Space Chupacabra Go, Jesus in India, and others that I'm sure also have marvelous names. <laughs> He's produced with Ma Yi Magic, EST, Natco, Children's Theater Company, Milwaukee Rep, and more, including the Cultural Center of the Philippines and with PCPA in Seoul, Korea. He's received the Helen Merrill Award, Herb Albert Award in the Arts, and Horton Foot Prize, and is a current Guggenheim Fellow. He was elected in 2016 to the Dramatists Guild Council. Kit Yan is a yellow American, New York-based artist, born in Enping, China, and raised in the Kingdom of Hawaii. Kit is the 2021 Kleben Prize winner and a 2019 Vivace Award winner and former fellow at the Dramatists Guild Foundation, McDowell, and the Playwrights Center. Their forthcoming work includes physical and digital productions with Playwrights Horizons, Keen Company, and OSF. Their work has previously been supported by Fifth Avenue Theater, the Smithsonian Village Theater, Diversionary Theater, and many more. Kit is currently under contract to write their first movie musical, movie musical for television. That's exciting. And Che Yu has directed at The Public, New York Theater Workshop, Playwrights Horizons, Signature Theater, Humana Festival, Oregon Shakespeare Festival, The Goodman, Berkeley Rep, and South Coast Rep, among others. His plays were produced at The Public, Manhattan Theater Club, Long Wharf, La Jolla Playhouse, 
Wilma Theatre, Studio Theatre, and at the Royal Court in London, Napoli Teatro Festival Theatre Works in Singapore, Four Arts in Kalua Lampur, and La Mama in Melbourne, amongst others. He received the Obie Award for Direction, London Fridge Award for Best Play, and Glad Media Award, um, uh, Glad Media Award. Now you know I'm reading. I just <laughs> messed that up and gave myself away. From 2011 to 2020, he was the artistic director of Victory Gardens Theater in Chicago. Thank you all so much for being here. I'm delighted to open this conversation with you. And um, let me just say, I, I have a whole bunch of questions <laughs> to, to ask you, uh, but I also please uh, feel free to jump in uh, and ask each other questions or answer other questions that we, we, we can keep this very conversational here. Um, I'd like to open, if I may, by asking the same question of all of you, and that is that um, what is your playwriting uh, uh, production process? And I, I ask this because I've talked with people who, um, uh, playwrights who start with uh, an ending and figure out how they're going to get there. And I've talked with directors who um, work very collaborative, collaboratively with their artists uh, as they can. And I've never heard the same answer from any two theater artists. So I would really love to hear from you about this, if we may. Um, Lloyd, would you like to start? Sure. Uh... Yeah, and I, I was just talking about this recently with, uh, like, as part of this program, so the answer is kind of fresh in my mind. The, and my answer right now is very different than it was when I was um, a younger writer. I think it, my process tends to be dictated by what's going on in my life, which is, you know, uh, probably not unusual and probably why so many different people have different processes. But what I do lately is I'll sit with something for a really long time before I even sit down and start writing a word. Um, in particular, because these days I've been writing a lot about history. Um, and so the work I've been doing has been a lot more research intensive than stuff that I've done in the past. And so I'll sit with something for a really long time, just try to feel like um, I've done the kind of research that I need, all the prep work that I need in order to sit down and start writing so that once I start writing, I don't have to, you know, interrupt myself by looking things up, but just be ready to go into a flow. Um, and uh, yeah, I've, it, it kind of works well with just like the, the rhythms of my life in a way, um, because I can just kind of plan on blocking off certain amounts of time. Um, but it does mean that I'll go stretches of time without actually sitting down and writing. Um, but the process itself is kind of always cooking and I kind of find other ways of, uh, keeping an idea alive and popping in my brain. Um, even on the days when I'm not physically able to sit down at a, at a, at a computer. Uh, and in general, do you allot a certain portion of your day? This is what I am going to do, whether I feel it or not. No, I wish I could do that, but uh, like I, you know, yeah, I mean, you know, actually, who am I kidding? I didn't even do that when it was possible in my life. Like, uh, like right now, like because I have three small children, um, you know, we're, there's this whole virtual thing going on with the schools and the hybrid schedules and stuff like that. So it's really like a kind of situation where, in order to feel like I have a groove. I'll just put it in my calendar like a week away or like I'll set a deadline for myself so that there's low stakes pressure where like if I show up and my pages are terrible, then I'll feel bad and I'll feel like a wasted opportunity, but it doesn't mean the end of the world. Like it's low, low enough stakes where I can fail and it's fine. <laughs> um, uh, but it's high enough stakes where I'll feel terrible and it motivates me to actually try and do something good, you know? And uh, so basically I'll do that. I'll, and knowing that that deadline is looming, just kind of, you know, it kind of, it does what it does psychologically, whatever that is, it just makes you feel like, you know, you get ready, you get a little nervous, you start to think, you start to prep a little harder, you start to, um, you know, the, the, the wheels start going a little quicker so that once I have that time and knowing like, oh, I, I've been sitting on this for a while, I'm ready to start putting this down that once I get going, that I can really, uh, that can really start to cook. Um, and it means that 
you know, sometimes it means my first drafts are better because I've sat with it for a long, like my first drafts are better than they were when I was a younger writer, just because I sit with them longer. Um, or they're cl better is a weird word. They're closer to what I want them to be. <laughs> it's, it's a more apt way of describing it. But, um, uh, but it does mean that I have to set, you know, multiple deadlines for myself so that I can rewrite as needed. Um, so that I don't feel like, you know, also so I don't feel the pressure of like, oh, I got to get it all in one, um, in this one day. And then are you getting those drafts? Do you have certain people you have read your drafts or do you have actors read them out loud for you? That's a good, yeah. This is a, so uh, <laughs> I have, fr like, I, basically I have these, I have some friends that I always, um, that I just rely on. I don't like, I tend to, um, yeah, I'm a little, it's weird because I used to work in new play development and like in, in admin capacity. And I, uh, so I work like I oversaw programs that were very helpful that I could see how helpful they were to other writers, but they were like the, the furthest from my process as I can imagine. Like what I like to do, I'm, I tend to be very, very private with a piece of work until I'm ready for it too. Um, until I'm kind of ready, until there's a point at which I'm, I'm ready. And before that, I rely on friends, like people who know me really well, people who I know them really well, so I know how they're responding and what, it, you know, that they're responding as themselves. Um, and uh, uh, I also know, like, you know, I can tell things just based on the way I, they're reacting. And especially if I'm doing something that's a little different than what I usually do, they have the context for that as well, because they know my work, I know their work, all that kind of thing. Um, and so I rely on, uh, like, close friends, really, until the point at which I'm ready um, to, you know, not release it in the world, but to start to see how... Um, other people <laughs> how receive the work. Um, and, you know, generally that's a slow trickle, but once I'm ready, then I, you know, I think because I do all that prep work, once I'm ready, I feel less nervous and less precious about it, um, which is healthy for me because when I'm nervous and precious about something, it's, it's not, I'm, I'm very bad. I'm very bad at it. <laughs> I can become too nervous and too precious about something. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, totally. Kit, what about your process? Um, hi, uh, thanks for asking. My, I, I'm gonna just do a quick intro. My name is Kit. I use they, he, and she pronouns. I'm super grateful to Creative Lab Hawaii and you, Donna, for having me today. Um, I'm dialing in today from Oahu. Uh, I'm in Waipio, the land of the Kanaka O'ihi. And uh, I'm a big fan of both of the uh, other panelists here today. I watched the Chinese ladies premiere in, in New York City. And then I watched Cambodian rock band at the signature that Che directed. Um, so I've seen both of your work and, and really love it. Um, let's see, for process, I, Lloyd, I totally am like vibing with what you're saying in terms of it looks so different through the years. Uh, I think my process probably like a decade ago was just journaling. I just like journal everything and then like try to make something out of it. And then it's not too different from how I write now. <laughs> But it, except now journaling is just one part of like my larger process. So I actually write, uh, I will say I write almost every single thing I do lately, whether it's a monologue, a short play or a long form musical movie pilot, um, the exact same way. And that's because I'm, I'm a little bit um, rigid and in how I want to approach something just because um, I am a Gemini and I, my mind is highly disorganized. So if my process is not organized, I can't get it to do what I want it to do. And so I keep a running list of ideas, newspaper articles, uh, historical facts uh, in a Google spreadsheet. And I pull from that list like new things. And on every Monday morning, I have a meeting with my creative collaborator, Melissa Lee, and I pitch my new ideas to her. If it's an old idea that keeps popping up, I'll pitch it again. <laughs> And most often she didn't, she vetoes all of them. And once in a great while, she says, yeah, that sounds good. And, uh, and, and you know, I, I hear her ideas as well, though she's more discerning than me. She'll wait for a great idea, but I'll just pitch all of them. And, um, and then uh, I always start off like with a, a, a brainstorm like of, of ideas and then a free write and I'll just do a bunch of journaling around it. And then 
after that, um, we always, uh, I'll, I'll go into um, organizing the beats of a story, uh, usually most importantly, the emotional arc of the character slash myself. <laughs> and then I'll do a scene by scene outline. And then um, if I'm writing by myself, I'll write. But then if I'm writing with someone else, we, uh, I'll, uh, we'll assign parts. Can you talk a little bit more about Melissa, your creative partner? Is, is this someone that you sought out to work with specifically for playwriting? Yeah, Melissa and I got to know each other because I went to undergrad in Boston and then she is from Boston and we, we met, we formed a band, we went on a 34 state tour and that became the basis of our first musical, Interstate. And uh, we've been writing together since 2008. We've been writing musicals together since 2012. Um, so it's been a long-standing, beautiful collaboration, but most importantly, a friendship. She's like one of my best friends. She's somebody I trust, um, somebody I just like being around. And so I, I feel like that's really important in a collaboration. Wow, that's awesome. I'm, that's awesome that you two found each other and that's a wonderful way to work. Che, che, what about you? Can you tell us a little bit about your process? Deadlines. And usually not set by me. <laughs> I mean, I was just thinking what you just said, you know, about process. And I realized, I think all my work has had a deadline set by the theater for production. So being fortunate that way, there's always this thing where you have to find a place to stop or place to actually begin so that you can deliver the play. So it's been very helpful that way. And I think it's probably, a, you know, um, a thing that I picked up in college, term papers and I still do that wonderfully. I, I love deadlines, so that's been helpful. And it depends on the play. I mean, um, I realize that uh, I tend not to repeat a certain structure of a play. So it just depends on what the play is and what the structure is going to be. And just like I think Lloyd and even Kit, you know, you spend a lot of time thinking about the play, walking around with it, reading, uh, reading it up, particularly like what Lloyd said too, if it's historical. I've done a few historical plays that require a massive, massive amounts of reading. And then at some point, it's time to all put it into a paper or into the computer. And there's a big, ugly, ugly, unwieldy mess. And once I type end of play, that's my so-called accomplishment for the day. Then I'll come back maybe a week later and the real process begins, the rewriting. I tend to love exploring the play through rewrites over and over again. And then at some point when I'm ready, I'll share it with some people so that we can read it out so I can hear it. And then, um, then it's ready to go into casting and rehearsals. That's the process so far. And then do you usually stay involved with your work it, it, once casting and rehearsals are rolling? Yeah, I think I finally got into a groove of it with my second or third play. When I was younger, you know, I, my first play uh, was in London. And I didn't want to stay around for rehearsals because... I spent six months working, well, kind of like hanging out with my friends and the theater company was actually, you know, give me a place to stay so I could write this play. So once I finished it, I realized I ran out of money, spent too much time clubbing and partying, had to go back to Boston where I this, packed up everything, went to LA and did this TV film thing, which I promised to do. And through that process, I learned that there's some rewrites I had to do and we had to fax each other rewrites. And that was those days. And uh, yeah, so basically to some extent, um, depending on the process um, and rewrites, uh, I tend to get very involved with everything. And I guess probably that's the reason why I'm directing at the moment, right? More than I am writing because it's seeing the bigger picture and I've eased into that actually more easily than anything else, so. All right, thank you. I am. Uh, look, actually, this is another question that I'd really like to hear from all of you about, and it's what's the most useful ed piece of advice that you have gotten that still helps you today? Lloyd, I just saw you unmute yourself. <laughs> Would you like to jump in? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I think this is related, and it's a piece of advice that I just gave <laughs> to Sean Dunnington, who I'm working with as part of this process, about... Um, uh, it's related to this idea of sitting with a thing for a while. And it's uh, my first ever playwriting teacher uh, when I was an undergraduate at Indiana University, Dennis Reardon. He told me this, he said this thing of like, okay, one way to, you know, the way, real way to write, write a play is you 
know everything about it. You know how it starts, you know how it ends, you know what it means, you know how you get there, you know all of it. Um, and then when you sit down to write it, you are absolutely under no cir circumstances allowed to follow that plan. Um, which is great because it's like, that's, you know, you it gives you a structure and something to like, to fall back on if you get lost. I think it helps you not get lost because you're, you always have a direction. Um, but you're mindful of the fact that you're looking for those places to deviate. You're actively looking for the surprises. You're actively looking for disruption to this sort of rigid plan. But what it means is like, in order to come up with that goal, you've already laid a, enough groundwork, sat with it long enough that when you sit down, you're ready to go. And I think that the reason that advice has stuck with me so much is because I found that it's like similar to the process of an actor, which is like, you know, you memorize lines, you do all this stuff, but once you're in a scene, you can't like, if you're, if you're thinking you're in a lot of trouble, right? You have to be impulsive. You have to let yourself be impulsive. So that stuff, that prep has to be so ingrained. It's like second nature where you're not thinking about it anymore. And you're letting your subconscious, which is always a better artist than your conscious mind be uh, more active. And I've, uh, the other thing, <laughs> the other reason it's resonated is because I find it useful in life of like defining, like, what do I want out of my life? And then you come up with these plans and these goals and these destinations that help you when you're feeling lost, it give you direction, but they also are like, I don't want to just do that. I want to look for ways in, in which I disrupt those impulses and constantly check in about like how I'm feeling about that. Um, so yeah, that's a piece of advice that I got that um, I uh, return to again and again. Awesome. I'm, I'm taking it. I'm stealing it. <laughs> Kit, what about you? Um, let's see a piece of advice that I received. I, Melissa and I usually reference the same piece of advice because um, a couple years ago in our, our Dramatist Guild Foundation Fellowship, uh, Andrew Lippa came in and uh, told, like, said to us that, um, that something that he tries to practice is uh, to be kind about other people's work and to be like generous and gracious about, about um, what people are writing and creating. And I, you know, I try to, try to remember that and try to carry through um, in my life. I guess, you know, upon further reflection I'm thinking of putting that into practice that like everyone's plays and musicals and books and everyone's art is like a dream of theirs. And it's a dream that, you know, I'm like listening to you Lloyd talk about how it, it, you sit with it. This is a part of you, it's in your body, it's in your heart, it's in your mind. And, and that is, that's how people's art lives in this world for them. I think particularly I've been really, um, you know, watching, supporting, uplifting work by uh, queer folks, trans folks, people of color, women, um, folks who are disabled, um, voices who are uh, historically have been oppressed or marginalized or silenced. And, you know, I think when I was first starting out like over a decade and maybe about a decade ago in the, th like, figuring out my first piece of theater, I, I did feel like, even if it wasn't spoken a lot, sometimes some, some judgment from people watching the workshops or the readings and, and that sort of thing. And I don't wanna be one of those people for anyone at any point in their process. I think I, I would, I wanna employ like, um, just sort of like positivity and generosity and support of particularly like folks in my community's voices, regardless of where they are in their process. Um, Cause I know for me, my first pieces were so messy. They were like ramblings and journals and pieces of songs and lyrics and poems just all kind of meshed together. And, uh, and I, I really appreciate the people who saw that and said like, oh, I see what you're trying to do. And I, I support, you know, what story you're trying to tell even if I, I don't understand it. <laughs> And I feel super grateful for all those folks in my life and, and hope that I can become one of those people as well. Beautiful. Thank you. Che? So advice you give to yourself or to other people? The best <laughs> advice that either that you have received. Oh. Finish it. 
don't think so much about it. That's what I remember. <laughs> but I think distilling a lot of people's um, conversations to me, I think this, the only thing that I hold very dear is it should cost you to write a play. Um, it's, it, it, it should be your truth that you're trying to express. And the fact that when you express that, it has to be honest and it has to come out from some place of you, you of, of, of your, your, your being. So to some extent, what I'm trying to say is we can write anything that we want to, but sometimes some plays actually come from a dark place or a place in your life that you feel that you need to give space to. Mm -hmm. And sometimes these are very hard things to write about. Um, I'm not talking about, you know, for the sake of trauma, but to actually cast some light, especially communities who do not have voices are not very visible. So sometimes what we do, particularly, I would say, most uh, writers of color, um, we carry our communities on our shoulders. We come from a lot of places where people who have opened doors for us to enter this specific time and space. And the responsibility hasn't ended. We still have to open those doors. As we know, there's a current wave of anti-Asian violence sweeping across the country and the world. And part of it is because I don't think Asian Americans nor non-Asian Americans know the history or our story and see our stories told more frequently on media, on stage, and in every form of storytelling. We are a part of the American narrative. And to some extent, we need our narrative told more frequently so that non-Asian Americans can understand and also embrace this part of American history. So as a result of this, saying all these things, we have to write bravely. We have to write truthfully. And all of us come from different communities and backgrounds. And these stories are unique. And the more that we tell these stories, I think, I hope we can connect better. And I think, I think that's the reason why we're in theater. We're trying to share something. And some of the stories that we have may be a little more complicated and complex. I think invisibility is something that we are trying to strive for. So write with courage, write as if something would cost you. Does the cultural climate and, and your support, uh, uh, your culture dictate the work that you do? And Meaning, the people with whom you work? Uh, what projects you select? Um, I think ultimately, I think all my fellow artists here can say the same thing. I think it's complicated because sometimes um, theaters around the country or the world um, see whether our stories are worth telling because it's based on either who's going to show up um, or are, are these stories um, amenable to people who come to the theater so that they get they understand the play. So, and there's an expectation of our community, a, a kind of characteristic, sometimes that producers may want to see that reinforced, even though I think they are versions of us that we find, which are caricatures and stereotypes. So we fight that. I think I know Kit's work and also Lloyd's work, you know, sometimes we, we fight it with humor. Sometimes we find small places to do our work. And I can safely say, you know, even knowing Lloyd's work and Kit's work, sometimes we don't find big venues. And sometimes that's, you know, it's, 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 um, it's unfortunate. But more importantly, I think our stories need to be told. So we need to find homes for that. And sometimes the 99 seat theaters, theaters, community theaters who celebrate our own community produce our work. And that's important. But I just do hope that our work gets to be, go out a little bit more. And I think that solution may be adventurous producers, artistic directors who feel and think like we do, saying that this story, this play, this musical needs to occur because it's important. It's important to our conversation as American citizens. Come talk to me at Kumukuhua Theater. <laughs> but, uh, um... Uh, and I hear you. And and uh, I want to say that we've done some difficult work there that it's hard to watch. It's hard to watch the story of what Marshallese diaspora are facing when they move to Hawaii. It's hard to watch those shows, but there's an audience uh, as long as you're working with theaters that are willing to take those, take those chances. Um, I, uh, Lloyd, um, would you talk a little bit about your definition of success and how it has evolved during your career? Well, that's interesting. Um, after what Che just said, because I think there's there's 
there's a connection. I think that, you know, you know, Che, like, <laughs> like, it's so funny that because when we think about a big venue, like in our in our profession, a big venue and a small venue, like, what are we talking about? Like, if we're talking about work that we're hoping can fundamentally change a cultural narrative, the difference between 99 and 499 is not very much, <laughs> like it's five times as much, but it's, if you're talking about the world, like that's like the difference between like one, and like you know, like it's, these are infinitesimal differences. And so um, like when we're talking about venues, I don't know, like what is success? Like when I was, when I was first starting out, like, of course, like these external definitions of success are not, um, they're unavoidable, right? They're, they can't help but permeate because they're the way in which our society values our work and chooses to validate who we are. It's the way our marketplace, the industry tends to say, these are the people who are good at this job. And it's very present tense, it's very commodity based and it's very um, numbers based. It's very economic and capitalist. And, uh, and it's very much based on the critical gaze of, um, richer, older, um, heteronormative, uh, cis white male power, like <laughs> historical power. And so, uh, like, uh, what does it mean to be successful under that gaze? Like, right. What does that mean? And my definition of success, you know, like, I don't know, like it evolves all the time. I don't know. Like, I don't actually know, but I know that the things that I grapple with are, there are three things I consider. I consider like, myself like i've been writing a lot about history so a lot of that is like what do i need to do like che when you say it should cost you something to write it it should cost me something not to too you know if there's this thing of like what if i don't do that what what will i lose i lose something if i don't do this right so then you go you dig deep into that hole and these are traumatic some of these are you know some of this history is not fun it's not fun to sit there and think about the the humiliation and degradation and shame that's in our history uh in this country but those t and so leaning into that voluntarily and spending time there is like why am i doing like you have to ask yourself why am i doing this like what am i hoping to get out of it so my first audience in that question is me like how is this going to make me better How's it going to make me a better writer? How's it going to make me a better father, a better citizen, a better friend, a better person in this um, in this culture? And the second one, who am I going to work on this with? Like, if I'm going to sit and ask somebody to memorize all these lines and stand up in front of a bunch of strangers and pretend to be this person eight times a week, like, I'm going to be in a real conversation with this person, with these people. Like, we're going to talk about this history in a palpable like meaningful way, or why are we doing it? And if we're going to engage in that, then the text that I bring them to memorize, I want to be something that really grapples with that stuff. So that, you know, even if it's not, even if they're doing it for 99 people or 499 people, there is meaning in the room itself, in the process itself, in the fact that we're grappling with this with like just the people we're in the room with. And then, um, uh, I'm, you know, obviously there's the audience. But um, I can't control that. That becomes an external model of success, right? Of like, who am I talking to? Who are you talking to? Like, I can control who shows up. So I, I almost don't think about that. I don't think about like, what theater should this be at? Which theater is going to have the best advance or what? I stopped thinking. I, don't, I just don't think about that anymore. And in a way, I don't think about it anymore for self-preservation too. Because I've worked predominantly in culturally specific theaters. And I find that I do more adventurous, more daring work when I'm in those spaces than I'm when, when I'm in spaces where I feel like the other. I just don't feel as safe there. Um, so uh, that's telling. And the third thing that I think about is the future. Because I think like there's something about theater that, um, you know, we're, we're bred to think that Film is permanent and lasts longer and endures greater. But I don't, I think that's nonsense, you know? Like, as soon as you film a film, it's past tense. Like, if you go to a movie theater and watch it on premiere night, it's past tense. It already happened. It's a document of something that already happened. You could take a, uh, you know, if, you, if somebody does uh, Hamlet, 
Now it's present tense. You know, it could be the oldest document in the world, but if, if somebody stands, memorizes that text, stands up in front of you live and says it, um, it's present tense. And I, that's what appeals to me about it. And thinking about like the conversation that we're having now, um, there's a part of it that's like in preparation of a future, but there's also thinking about the ways in which a play can endure. What could this mean? You know, even if it only plays to five people today, maybe it can speak to somebody a hundred years from now. Like, I don't know what, what Shakespeare thought about the future. I don't know what um, uh, any writer ever thinks about what they, they can do in the future. But I think, um, I think it's, it's not a bad thing to think about. It can be humbling and it can be, um, wildly productive uh, to try and communicate across time in that way. I, that's fascinating. I've, I, I've never heard a playwright speak about re revival uh, uh, of their work and, and, and where that might be. I also think that every time you see a play for the first time, what you walk away from the theater with, that's the art. And every time you see that play for the second time, what you walk away with, it, it, it's always gonna be a different experience. Um, okay, so Kit, in, in, in light of this direction, we, um, uh, I, I'd like to hear you talk a little bit about the business of theater for you as you have experienced it uh, within the LGBTIQ community. Uh, um. Stop talking, Donna. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks for asking. Let's see, the business of, of theater you know, within my identity. Um, let's see, I'm gonna sort of piggyback a little bit off of the conversation that Lloyd, I think you're starting here and, and, and that you're having with Don in terms of what is success. Um, Cause I think it's probably related. And, um, you know, I, feel like for me being in the business of theater and figuring out like what success means for myself it, it's like am I happy doing what I'm doing every day <laughs> am I like am I getting up and going like wow I want to I want to write this story or I want to work with these people or I want to trust my my life with um with who I'm collaborating with and so uh it it's a little bit related in terms of um working telling queer stories. Uh, you know, I, I tell like primarily queer stories. So I'm, I, most of my characters are in a world in which their identities are a part of the world. Uh, most often there's a trans main character, but most often there's actually like more than one <laughs> trans main character in my stuff. And um, it's, what I, it's what I love, it's what I know, it's what I live. I write a lot from personal experience. I write a lot about trans masculinity. I write a lot about um, gender fluidity. I write a lot about like a, a journey around gender. And so that's, that's often um, you know, what I guess I'm quote unquote selling, but it's just what I like to do. That's, the, I mean, at the heart of it, it's what I want to do. It's what I like to do. And when I think about the world I want to live in and even like going back to the definition of success, like. I want to live in a world that feels really free for folks um, who from, from with many walks of life, folks who are, um, have uh, people of color, like gender parity, um, ability, uh, indigenous voices. Like I, I want to live in a world in which we're all seeing each other. And actually something you said, Che, was really affected, affecting me um, when you were talking about like, what kind of producers we need in the future and, and or producers, artistic directors, administrators, like the people that make our stuff um, or present our stuff, really, we make our stuff. Um, is, is that like, I, I wanna live in a world in which like people say, uh, are able to say like, that may, may, that's not my story, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna support that or that's not my experience or I don't know what you're talking about maybe even, or I don't even, I don't speak that language, but it's important for me to to buy a ticket to that or just give the money or make that show. Um, and so I hope that's 
there are people out there who do do that. And when I think about the kind of work that I make, there are people who uh, live that experience. And then there are people who don't that present that work. And, and that that's kind of what it's been like for me in terms of navigating the theater. It's like uh, just finding, finding my people, finding my family, finding my community. I think that's the people you're going to want to be on that journey with anyways, because <laughs> like, they're going to really uplift the story or work on that story, give you space and step away from that story in the way that you, that story needs to be told. Nice. I, I, the playwright Victor Rogers said that all work is autobiographical. So y y you are putting yourself out there and the community that you have around you and the, uh, that you bring along and that you create while you're there is, is everything, right? Um, che, your first play was banned in Singapore. Is, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I, you know, I, tying up with what uh, Lloyd and Kit said too, you know, the reason why sometimes we have to write from who we are is because sometimes we're the first people to write about it. And Kit is a different generation. And I, me having been maybe a little older, it was something that I never thought of and you just wrote. So you just wrote gay Asian characters. And next thing you know, you get volleys from the Asian community who can be your most vocal critics. In the terms of the first play, I was in the military service because it was mandatory in Singapore, so I had to do that. And while I was there, I was doing theater, and there was a play coming up called um, Safe Sex. And I said, oh, great. Um, maybe I should audition for it. And they say, well, it's not been written. And I said, uh, how much are you paying to get it written? <laughs> and he says, $500, and I say, I'll write you one. So at the time, I was actually... Um, before I came back to Singapore, I was in New York as a call. I mean, I was uh, in New York, but I was a student, undergrad student in California, but I had seen a play called The Normal Heart that changed my life. Gay politics is complicated. And I think I came to a place where here's freedom. You can be who you really want to be and death politics is occurring and you can be who you are and your people are dying. And that politicized not me, only me as a person, but also the work that I write. So ultimately the work that I had written for the Singapore theater was a little more political. It's about, you know, um, AIDS. And the government banned it only because they thought the gay character was sympathetic and not basically contrary to the social mores of the country. And I didn't want to change anything or write anything, so I left. And came back to the States while driving across from LA to Boston, the theater called up and said, look, you have to do this play. I know you have your little um, thing about creative rights and what you think is right and what is wrong, but you have to tell the story because something bad is happening from Bangkok all the way down to Singapore. So I thought about it and wrote it for the censors. So basically maintain my story, but it taught me only one lesson in playwriting. My first lesson is how to write subtextually. So that, it, so that it could bypass the censor, but yet when they rehearsed it, when the audience got it, it was a whole different level, which I had wanted them to. So that was the play. Wow. That's a, it's an amazing way to get to come to that lesson. It is, but I think, you know, we always try to learn from experiences and being banned. I thought it was kind of great when I was, um, when I was being banned at the time, my phone was being tapped. I was speaking to the journalists, and I was in the military. So even my commander said, there's a dossier on you, you know that, right? And I said, yeah, whatever. <laughs> and the Singapore government was also banning Time Magazine because it spoke negatively of the government. So my phone calls with my American friends who are journalists, we always hit clicking sounds on the phone. It's kind of silly and yet it's not like the cold war, but it was an experience. It was an experience. Wow, but if I heard clicking on the phone, it was my sister upstairs <laughs> listening. A whole, whole He's different dropping. world. My <laughs> goodness, my goodness. Uh, uh, okay, so um, along the lines of this conversation, and I mean, look at me. I have seen myself on screen and stage all, all of my life. There, there's, uh, um, there's me, <laughs> people who look like me and act like me and go through my experiences. For, for I'd like to ask each of you, what was the, the first theatrical experience you had that, that really moved you? 
uh, Lloyd, let's go ahead and stick with the order I've been going through here all along. <laughs> I can't. I uh, you have to come back to me. I can't think of oh. one, <laughs> or uh, of one that was early enough to be for. Yeah, I'll come come back to me. Sure. Who Kit? Yeah, I'll go. Let's see. I feel pretty. Um, I feel really blessed in terms of my first theatrical experiences. Okay, I can't remember the whole story of this. I know I'm so ashamed to say that, especially on this particular panel, because. I should know the I should know I know the general gist of it, but my first play I watched was how the B fifty two learned to fly, and uh, <laughs> and that was that was when I was a little kid here in Hawaii. So my first theatrical experience was a local story um, told by a local playwright, and that maybe that you know that has carried with me throughout like my whole life, and in going like oh okay like this is somebody close to me or in my community writing about something that they know. And so, um, and then my second, uh, my first musical and my second live theatrical piece was my writing partner, Melissa Lee's first musical, Surviving the Nien, which is about a, an interracial lesbian couple, an Asian American woman and a black woman who go to Hong Kong to, during Chinese New Year to share their identities and their relationship with the family and celebrate the new year. And so the, in each category, the first thing I saw was like really close to home. And so, um, that maybe has shaped how I have learned to tell story. Um, and then I didn't grow up exposed to a whole lot of theater, uh, except how the B-52 learned to fly. And so I didn't start watching, like, I didn't see Shakespeare until two years ago, mm -hmm. I think. And uh, I didn't watch some of the things that are considered part of the American canon until very, very recently. Um, and so, and I have mostly seen a lot of plays and musicals by people in our communities. And so we can't stop doing that. That has to be like a very important part of, of the ecosystem. Um, but yeah, those, those have always stuck with me as pieces out there. That's marvelous. You know, I, I often feel like female playwrights, there's a lot of female playwrights who write with a male voice because mm -hmm that's what they learned is theater. So how refreshing, Kit. That, was that HTY that did that show? Okay, I see my best friend Lori texting me right now and I know she <laughs> went too. So correct me if I'm wrong, Lori, I'll tackle in the Q&A. I think it was at Diamond Head Theater, right? Oh, good for them. But I'm I, so glad I, I you had that. Yeah, so Lori just texted me, yes, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lori. <laughs> uh, che? Um, the touring production of M. Butterfly in Boston. And um, it was my first Asian play, even though, you know, back in Singapore, we were doing Asian plays. It was a whole different experience, of course. And I had, at the time, was turning in my thesis and had written a kind of a film. And I chucked it because nobody wanted to kind of like work on it because it was risque. So I'd sent something in and my friend brought me to, asked me to come to London to work on a, you know, just to be a playwright in residence in London. And like I said, hung out for a bit. And finally I decided to write the play and I realized I'm going to change with the lead character to an Asian man. And I realized, which is interesting too, that all the so-called uh, quote unquote trauma or the so-called uh, experience that I've had as a gay Asian man and being in London, particularly, it was an opportunity for me to really explore it in this play. And it was hard. And up to today, to some extent, um, I don't like that play. It's done all the time in a weird way. And when I see it, I don't see a version of myself that is today. I saw that young kid that was completely shunned, not spoken to and treated really terribly. So to some extent, you know, David's play allowed me to say, I could actually see myself and my community's faces in the place that I can create. So that was the uh, great experience of watching that play. Wonderful. Okay, Lloyd, was that enough time? Yeah, I, I, I still don't have a real answer. I mean, if I thought about it more, I probably could, but I'm gonna kind of cop out and say, um, like, I think that the real, the like, I understand the spirit of the question. <laughs> so I'll try to answer the spirit of the question without literally asking, which is that, um, 
like when I was growing up, like the formative times of my life, my relationship with theater was kind of non-existent. Like I, I grew up in Indiana. I grew up, uh, you know, one of the few Asian American kids that I had ever met. Um, uh, and I was, so, I, you know, it's not a place where um, there's a lot, there's a theater culture, but it's also not a place where there's an Asian American culture to speak of. And I remember, uh, you know, you go to the movies and you would, I, like, I remember, like, Che, you probably remember this too. We, when you go to a movie and you see an Asian person show up. It's not a, it's not like, oh, look, it's immediately like you're, you're laughing because, you know, you're immediately like, oh, God, what are they going to do to that person? <laughs> like, it's like they're going to be humiliated. You know, if there's an Asian person in a movie, they're going to humiliate this person. Right? And I just knew that. And I remember that feeling of like that clenching. And so that clenching is formative. And I think that what happened, um, like when I was in college, like I always thought I would be a novelist and writing for me was something that was private. But when I was in college, I started to feel like being a little more uh, uh, in society or in community with people. And so I started to really get into it. And the true answer of like the most formative work was really the stuff that I was seeing like, um, you know, this is, this is the nineties. It was like a very indie time, a very kind of, you know, like a, a DIY time. And so the stuff that students were doing, like in the studio black box theater, like was just really, it felt gritty. It felt like, um, uh, self-indulgent in the best way. It was like, where well, you're really pushing the limits of yourself as a student and as the, like all that stuff. And it just felt subversive in a way that like, when I was doing things that felt a little challenging, where I was trying something new in the English department, I felt like I was, I was getting a, a kind of a negative attention. And when I was doing that kind of work in the theater department, I was getting positive attention. And so I was feeling like, I like hanging out in this space over here. So I started hanging out there more. And it was mostly because of that gritty feeling. And it was a way to sublimate and uh, feel like I am in this space. And hopefully when I am in this space and other Asian people see me, that they're not cringing or clenching their gut in anticipation of humiliation. I hope those days are over. Yeah. Um, I said, so we have a clarification. Kumu Tammy Hailiopua Baker says, Aloha Kako, mahalo for this panel and sharing your wisdom. How the B-52 Learned to Fly was an original play by Lisa Matsumoto at Kennedy Theater directed by Tammy Montgomery. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. I, <laughs> thank I you, really that. <laughs> Um, we, we just have a few minutes left and I think, well, I should ask, do you guys have any questions for each other or anything you'd like that we missed saying? Uh, uh, okay. I have, okay. We have, we have one more question here. Um, what do you think about adapting your plays to a zoom platform? Oh, thank you. Anonymous attendee for saying this. Um, uh, uh, how do you approach playwriting? for performance on Zoom platform? Anyone? How do you approach as a playwright or as a, what, uh, what do you mean? Uh, well, the I guess we can go where we want with this. It's, um, so what do you think about adapting plays for, that are meant for the stage for Zoom and how would you approach playwriting for the Zoom platform? I've done like teases of this, like, um, you know, when when stay at home first started, it was um, like there were a, a bunch of companies who like w would reach out to the people whose plays they had canceled and they would ask them to do these short things. So I wrote some short stuff like these just like short burst of things. And for that, it was like, I, you know, I was trying to find a way to to sort of use the medium in in a, in, you know, clever, but unobtrusive and also not too. Um, two obvious ways, I guess. Um, I don't think any of them were like hugely successful or anything like that. But it, it, like, I think that the, the, the thing about any time I step into a new medium, I think my first foray into it has to be some testing of the medium, like getting a feel for it, um, just so I can get a sense of that. And so, um, uh, 
my impulse is I don't really want to try to write for a virtual thing. You know, <laughs> I just, it's not something that I want to, uh, it's not a skill that I feel like I, I want to develop in myself <laughs> uh, or practice enough to get good at, good at it. I will say that I had um, a play, The Chinese Lady was recently like a student production. I, I kind of resisted virtual productions in general of it, but a student production in Princeton, there was a, a Princeton student who uh, wanted to do it as her thesis live, but, you know, if she's graduating, it also feels like she's graduating and she's her thesis, so maybe I should just let her do it virtual. But she also had this plan that was so well thought through that I was like, oh, if I'm going to have an, you know, have an opportunity to experiment with what it is for a piece that I already know very well to be done in a virtual format, this is a perfect opportunity. It's an inquisitive, very thoughtful and generous student inquiring on that same thing herself. So, uh, it happened and I think it was as, you know, at really as successful as a virtual thing could go. Like I felt great about it. They had conversations uh, with some amazing scholars to accompany it. And uh, uh, I still, it, you know, even though it went really as well as a virtual thing could go, I felt the absence of the thing. Like there were moments when it really did feel like, oh, these students are, they are amazing. Um, it made me wish I could actually spend time in the room with them. And so it does make me feel like um, uh, it, 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 it's never going to be a subs like an adequate substitute. But uh, when, you know, when that's what the, the world has to offer, <laughs> you can, you know, it, you can make do, but it will be making do. Gotcha. Uh, Kit or Che, would you like to chime in on this Zoom question? To Zoom or not to Zoom? <laughs> I'm with Lloyd. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I am too. I, I ha haven't adapted any of my works for stage to go on to the screen um, in a Zoom format. Uh, but I did write a couple of things during the pandemic for the format. And so anything that I've done during the pandemic has been written for the Zoom screen, uh, which has been really a fun muscle to exercise. But like Lloyd was saying, I don't think I'm gonna make a living, <laughs> a career out of the Zoom theater platform. But you know what it did do for me that was really great? I think it made me um, figure out a little bit of like how to write for, just write for the screen, mm -hmm. do a little bit of screenwriting practice. And then I think one great thing that came out of it um, for as an audience member is, is the accessibility part of it in terms of like the theater is so inaccessible. It, it's high price tickets. It's, it happens once and then it's gone. That one experience you're with the other people with um, which is the beauty of it, but also um, it's what's hard about getting all the people you want in your community to go see the show that you want them to go see, or you want the story you want to share with them. So the zoom format has made it possible for people who um, for like accessibility or like uh, maybe the geographic reasons are not witnessing the work. Yeah, I, you're gonna be doing some work with our friends at Keen Company. Um, I, I don't think they would have started doing radio plays had it not been for the pandemic. I think it's a, uh, this is gonna continue to evolve. This non-analog theater realm is gonna continue to evolve. And uh, we talk about accessibility um, like those podcasts, though, even if you don't have good internet, you can, you can listen to that. So people can come to theater somehow, uh, with these different avenues that, um, but I, uh, I miss being in a theater with living bodies breathing and we'll get, we'll get back there someday. Uh, we're out of time. You guys, I have really appreciated this conversation with you. Thank you so much. And thank you for being a part of our creative lab, Playwrights Immersive. Uh, our playwrights are so lucky to be working with you. And we are so lucky to have those playwrights. And we're looking forward to seeing where they go with the support that they're getting from you and from Creative Lab. So thank you very much for giving back uh, to our community and yours. I'm going to have to sign off now. This is uh, um, all the time that we have. 
Thank you very much to Lloyd, Kit, and Che for a great conversation. Thank you to Georgia and Michael and everyone on the team for making these conversations happen for all of us. The next webinar from Creative Lab Hawaii will be this Saturday, May 1st, 2021 at 1 p.m., exploring the contribution of storytelling by Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders to kick off AAPI Heritage Month. Please visit creativelab.hawaii.gov for registration information. And, and just so you know, if you go to Creative Lab on uh, Facebook, a lot of content is there from previous webinars that it's really valuable uh, conversations. On behalf of the State of Hawaii, DBET Creative Industries Division, the Hawaii State Theater Council, the Dramatist Guild Foundation, and the Dramatists Guild, have a great day, everybody. Thank you.